So today I have to make a small batch of blue spruce candles. And by small, I mean small, real small, like four. Four blue spruce candles in this size, this jar right here. And I figured if I've got to make the candles, I might as well record it in case anyone wants to follow along. So I hope you enjoy. Hi everyone, Wade Thomas, owner of Black Tie Bar and Candle Company. As many of you know by now, this channel is dedicated to teaching candle making and also candle business. So if you're not already a subscriber, consider subscribing, hit the bell notification for future videos. And as always, I appreciate you stopping by. So as I said in the introduction, I've got to make four blue spruce candles today. So today I got an order and in that order includes four blue spruce candles. As you notice here, I have three. As Murphy's Law states, whatever can go wrong will go wrong and at the worst possible time. Thanks Murphy. So what could go wrong? Well, what could go wrong is that I get an order for one more than I actually have. What did go wrong? I got an order for one more than I actually had. <laughs> So today, we're gonna fix that problem. I really only need one more blue spruce candle, but I'm gonna make a batch of four, so I have a couple more on hand in case I get another order for blue spruce in the next couple days. I'm not making more than that. Normally, my batches are eight, 16, 24, something like that, but I am relocating uh, very soon in the next couple weeks, so I'm trying to keep my inventory as small as possible until I relocate and rebuild the workshop. I hope you enjoyed this quick video of me making a small batch of these blue spruce candles. Give this video a thumbs up if you don't mind, and let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so to get started, the first thing we're gonna need to do is just get a couple supplies so we have them ready. Anytime I'm working with dyes, I always make sure I've got a couple gloves, but I tend to use gloves anyways. It just keeps everything a little bit cleaner. We're also gonna need four wick stickers. I'm only doing a batch of four, so that's all we need. And then we're gonna need four wicks. Now this recipe calls for four HTP 83 wicks. So here are my four HTP wicks. The next thing we're gonna need is the jars. So these are my nine ounce straight sided jars here. Just gonna get four of these guys out. Okay, so that sums up all the materials we really need to get kind of set aside and ready to go. The rest of it's just about mixing all the materials and getting the process going. Okay, so first real quick, just gonna wick these guys with the stickers. I just find the stickers to be nice and quick and reliable. I've never had any issues with the stickers coming loose. I think most of the time that is because they haven't been secured down to the jar quite as firm as they should be. Also, sometimes jars, depending on where they come from, can have some uh, debris or dust or whatever in the bottom of the jar. So cleaning those jars out can help the, stick, the wick stickers adhere better as well. And then just firmly sealing them down. Trying to use your fingers or a pen tube or something can sometimes just not get them real firm. Um, and that way they don't, and they don't really, I guess, stick as well as they could to the jars. For the most part, wick stickers work for, fine for me. So we just wick those four up. Okay, now this is usually the point I start gloving up just because I'll be handling jars a little bit more. And then I go right after this is when I go right to actually handling the wax and the dye. So what I'll do real quick is just go ahead and wick these guys up. And if you don't have one of these handy devices, they are really nice. It speeds the process of wicking a lot, um, you know, but they don't fit every jar. And so even though they would fit several jars, they're not perfect. And I've got, I talk about this a little bit in my uh, supplies video, so I won't go into details now, but just get those wicked up and ready to go. Space them apart just enough. Again, this is a small batch. This is not a very complicated process for just, for just a few candles. If I was doing dozens, then, you know, I take my time arranging them a little bit more. Okay, so now it's time to add the wax and let's and get going on the rest of the process. Now, I apologize, like I mentioned earlier, I am taking down this workshop uh, bits and pieces at a time because I am relocating, so I don't have the greatest setup right now. I'll try to stay in camera view as much as possible, but I do have another camera kind of overhead, overhead showing the process in a little bit more details. First thing we're going to need is to get the wax in the pot. Okay, sorry, I had to pause the video there real quick because I realized I didn't have any uh, paper towels that I might need, so hung those up. Also, I've already got the wax poured, as you'll see here. Um, I, I didn't really show getting the wax into the pot, but I guess next time I, I, I could do that. I'm going to need something to stir with. Now that it's in the pot, I have also need to check the temperature, and I did just stir it, so it's about 188 right now. I'm going to add the uh, UV inhibitor. Now this, it's a half a batch, is three quarters of a tablespoon of UV inhibitor. And that'll be the first thing I add, generally, just because 
uh, you want to get it in when it, the wax is hottest. And then obviously dye is the same thing. So, and, and if you do use Vibar in some waxes, this wax doesn't need it. But if you are using Vibar, you want to get that in as hot as, hot as possible too. For 6006, I, I heated this up to about 200, uh, maybe a tad less. So this recipe of blue spruce, I have, and again, this is a half batch, which is four of these candles, calls for three drops of hunter green. One, two, three. I'll set that aside for a sec. So I'll give the, that uh, hunter green a good stir. And then I'll also throw in summer breeze. Uh, summer breeze is just to give a little bit of blue. You don't want it completely green for this scent. At least for me, I didn't. And this is six drops. One, two, three, four, five, maybe. Five and six. And then again, I'll just set that aside for now. Get this stirred. About 175, 180. I got my blue spruce. Again, this is a half batch, and I don't always use plastic cups. I'll generally use a glass one, but I'm kind of in a hurry and everything's kind of hidden from me. 2.15 ounces. There we go. And then I'll get that in. I'll give this a nice good stir. There are several ways you can you can work with 6006. If you if you work with unpreheated jars, so just jars right out of a box, you're going to want to pour a little bit hotter. It'll cool a little too quick on you. And then and if you can cover them while they cool, that's even better. Now you still may deal with some jar adhesion issues, some shrinkage, and some possible sinkholes. So you just got to keep an eye on it. You can poke relief holes around the wick with like a toothpick during that process just to kind of keep them filled in and prevent sinkholes. And then of course you might need to go back over with a heat gun at the end. But my favorite method is the one I'm doing today, and that is if I have time, I will preheat the jars uh, for, you know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that, just to get them warm. And then you pour, so something around 165. And the benefit of that is it will slow down the entire cool process significantly, preventing sinkholes, giving better jar adhesion. I'll, I'll talk about that here again in just a little bit more detail. So we're about where I want to be. All right, and I repositioned that camera so maybe you can see this a little bit easier. We're just going to go ahead and pour these, and I know the amount is going to be right. But I'll usually fill them most of the way, and then go to the next one, and then I'll go back and finish them off, just in case. This is a really, really pretty blue color. It's kind of like a, you know, I tried to get close to an actual blue spruce color. And so, it's one of my favorite looking ones when it's done. So now, go back and kind of finish them off. And the wax amount should be pretty much dead on. I've done this long enough, and my pr recipes are pretty exact at this point. So as long as I measured correctly everything, then I'm usually really, cl really close. Okay. Do a little bit of cleanup real quick, and all I do is just kind of wipe out the jar with the paper towel I was using to kind of guide me uh, when I was pouring. And then a little bit of alcohol, rubbing alcohol, and then I wipe it back out, and that's, that's all there is to it. So I'll give you a little bit better shot here of them finished, and then I will straighten the wicks, of course. But you get the idea there. And then to straighten the or to uh, keep the wicks centered, I use. It depends on the jar, but I will use one of these guys on each one, and I give them a nice couple twists. And I'll talk about this here in a sec too. And actually, well, I, I can mention why I twist it right now. Uh, this recipe is using HTP wicks, which do curl, um, and any wicks that curl will also have a tendency to lean, and that is because as they curl, that adds a little bit more weight to that side of the wick, and that will cause them to lean that direction. The good thing about twisting your wicks is it will keep that curl going to different sides as it unwinds, and so it will help keep your wick centered throughout the burn of your candle much much better and it will also keep your burn pool much more even as well and keep the wick from leaning to one side too much so if you're not already doing that that's a really good trick i wouldn't over twist it you don't want to twist it so much you might pull it loose from the wick tab or anything like that but in a jar this size a couple good twists and that's usually plenty 
your cord wicks, you don't need to do that. Just your, your curling type wicks, like your HTP, your CDs, your Ecos, things like that. And then also I'll take a, I'll take a, a good little look after I'm done too, and make sure they all look about even again. They, they should be the recipe is to fill them kind of perfectly. But if I ever notice I overfilled one just a little bit and another one short, then I use these little plastic pipettes. I don't have one on me right now because, oh yes, I do. They look like these little pipettes and I also have these listed and linked in uh, in the description of one of the other videos uh, the supply video as well but what you can do is if you're just a little bit off in one you can just uh, just take out just a just a touch from another candle and fill in the other it's a good way not to have to try to get messy trying to even out your candles these are awesome so I would really recommend getting a bunch of these and again if you check out my getting started supplies video, these are linked in there at a really good price for like 500 of them. Okay, so now that the candles are poured, let's talk a little bit about some of the things I did when making candles with 6006. So this particular recipe, as I mentioned a few times, is normally an eight uh, an eight candle batch with this particular jar. So I'll normally make eight at a time. This was a half batch, I made four. And not all my candles use the same kind of wax either. It depends on the customer. For example, my wholesale accounts, private label accounts, or white label accounts, I use several different waxes. It just it just depends on the customer. But I also use some multiple kinds of waxes just in uh, different lines of candles. And this particular jar and size are actually three types of waxes that I use. And this particular one uses 6006. I have other videos talking about some of the pros and cons of each type of wax. And then I will also do more videos on other kinds of waxes at another point. But this particular recipe called for IGI 6006. And that is what I currently use in this candle. And this candle used HTP 83. But again, that varies by scent as well. I've got in this jar with 6006, I have candles that range from HTP 73 up to HTP 104. It just depends on how heavy the fragrance oil is. But anyways, back to 6006. I mentioned that there's several ways you can use 6006. There are several pour temperatures that work all right. Uh, really, you can pour as high as, you know, 175 if you want. Um, and you can, and then how low you pour, it kind of depends on if you preheat your jars or not. For me, I find the sweet spot for 6006 to be somewhere around 165 to 170. Now, if you are in a cold environment, you're going to have to pour hotter because it's going to cool way too quick. You're going to get potential cracks, sinkholes. It's really going to contract on you in the jar super quick. If you're working in an area that's kind of room temperature, 72 or something like that, most of the time, you don't and you don't preheat your jars. You know, 170 something around that range would work. Uh, it really it, it really just takes some testing experiment from you and your environment. Now, another thing that a lot of people do, especially with any waxes that have um, any tendency to shrink at all is you can cover them while they're cooling. My favorite method was 6006. If you have the time and you're working with a small enough batch, you can preheat your jars. And if you preheat your jars, then you can actually lower your pour temperature. You might be wondering, well, why lower my pour temp? I, you know, maybe I'd rather pour hot. Well, the benefit to lowering your pour temperature is wax shrinks and contracts as it's cooling. So the hotter wax gets, the more that it expands, and then as it cools, the more it will shrink. So the hotter you pour your wax into your jar, that means the more contraction is going to take place as it cools. And so the benefit of pouring at a low temp is there's less contraction. Less contraction usually means less sinkholes, less sinkage, and less, and less jar adhesion problems and wet spots. However, pouring at a too low of temperature also causes it to cool too quickly. That's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. You can avoid some contraction by pouring cooler, but you also are going to cool it much faster because of that. And fast, fast cooling is a bad idea. For example, you don't want to cool your candles by putting them in a fridge. It causes them to cool too quickly, which is the same problem at, as contraction. It will, it will kind of shock it, right? But the benefit of combining both preheated jars and low pour temps, as low as you can for that wax, is the low pour temp gives you that less contraction, right? So, less ability for the wax to shrink as it cools. And so that is the benefit of pouring low. You combine that with preheating your jars, and now you've also solved the problem of them cooling too quickly. So you're combining two different processes together that create this great overall pouring environment. You have warm jars 
with a lower pour temp. And so they work together brilliantly, and you're going to have really good success with that. But it's not always possible. If you're working with super large batches or you just don't have the ability to preheat your jars, you definitely don't have to. It just makes things easier for you if you can. If you can't, you can cover your jars. You can increase your pour temp a little bit. You might have to do a little bit more maintenance on your candle afterward. Um, for example, f- kind of fixing the tops. You might have to poke some holes around the wick um, as it's almost solidified and fill it back in, use a heat gun, things like that. So it's not the end of the world, but this really can help you out if you have the time. Now, this is specific to 6006. Not all candles, waxes work this way. So this is only regarding 6006. But hopefully that tip helps you out if you're not currently doing that or if you didn't quite understand why preheating jars and pour temps really mattered that much. That is why. And if you put them together, that really, really, really. And so because I'm using that method, because the jars are already warm, I don't really need to cover them. Now, you could still cover them if you wanted to, but sometimes it's hard to get in habits of doing things that don't scale real well. And so if you get in the habit of always covering your candles and building your process around covering your candles, it gets tricky if you start scaling up. So unless you have a way to scale up covering your candles, then try to perfect your process of not covering your candles. But definitely starting out for a while, I, I, I would do it. And one thing that can help is, I actually keep these by hand, I use these kind of baking pans. And if you can actually put one on the bottom, put your candles in, and then put another one on top. Now, with your bigger jars, that can be a little difficult, but it works with jars of this size. It works with tumblers and things like that. It just it may not work with your really tall candles, but that will also slow down your uh, cooling time, and it helps prevent messes, too, if you spill a little bit. Now, 6006 doesn't have much of a cure time, and cure time is kind of a weird phrase that uh, isn't actually 100% entirely accurate. It's not like we're curing meat or anything like that. We're not, curing is the process of adding some salt and some other things to... Well, I don't want to get into the details of that, but curing is not actually the technically correct term for what candle makers are, are talking about. It's it's become common nature to use that term, and so everyone does use it, but technically that's not really what a candle is doing. Really, we're giving the time the candle time to settle. That's pretty much it. Um, some waxes take longer to settle and be ready than others. Uh, obviously, soy takes a little longer. Soy takes longer for a couple reasons. One is it takes longer to, to solidify. Paraffin waxes will solidify rather quickly. Parasoys, somewhere, you know, somewhere in the middle. And then your soys will take the longest to solidify just because of the type of wax they are. That is one reason it takes a little longer. And then the other reason is it takes longer for fragrance oils to kind of bind together with the wax and um, kind of become one, if that makes sense. And because of that, sometimes you might notice much better uh, hot throw and fragrance output in a soy candle if you wait a week or two versus a paraffin candle can be ready in 24 hours. Well, 6006 is very similar to that. It can be ready in, you know, basically once it's solidified. Most people with 6006 will give it a couple of extra days just in case. But the way I look at it is by the time you make the candle, if you make to order, by the time you make the candle and ship it out, by the time they get it, it's it's completely ready to go. But I generally will keep my shelf stocked with anything popular because they're going in and out so quickly. But I still do make to order all the time. Um, like today, for example, someone ordered more than I had stocked, so that's one reason to make more. Um, sometimes people order candles that I don't just have on the shelf ready to go. Um, so, But anyways, that's one of the benefits of 6006. Quick cure time settling time whatever you want to call it and they're and they're ready to hit the shelf so hopefully this video was helpful it's a little bit about using 6006 i didn't label them yet i never label till after they're completely done because you never know if something's going to go wrong so once these are solidified i'll flip them over put on the warning labels and i'll attach the uh, product labels as well and the lids and uh, of course trim the wicks and i use uh, actually i got one behind here I use this particular wick trimmer. I go over this in the supply video that I posted recently as well. I'll try to remember to link that in this uh, video's description, but this is a great wick trimmer and it will cut it to exactly a quarter inch every time. So once this is done, I'll trim the wicks, add the jar, add the labels, and they'll be ready to go. Uh, as soon as this video is done, I will show you a few snapshots of the finished product. Hope everyone enjoyed this video. Please consider subscribing, hit the like button, and if you have any feedback at all, feel free to do that in the comment section below. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. Thanks.